tired of screwing up, tired of going down, tired of myself, tired of this town. Eminent Waste of Time, episode 14. I'm Doug. And I'm Chad. And we decided to do a New Year's Day podcast. We told you we were going to do one basically right after Christmas uh, into the New Year type of thing. And today's actually New Year's Day. So I think by law, we have to do some sort of 2017 year in review, right? Yeah, well, uh, that's what everybody does. So (laughs) we'll follow suit and to not show any creativity whatsoever, (laughs) that's what we'll do. (laughs) But it'll be about UTV stuff, so it'll be worthwhile. Yeah. And maybe not our acting careers and other stuff you probably don't care quite as much about. Yeah. But more importantly, how was Christmas? It was there. It was Christmas. <laughs> Doug almost <laughs> spit his water out of his <laughs> nose. It. That would have been funny. <laughs> that, that's it, huh? It was as, as we've discussed, I am not a Christmas person. <clears throat> uh, I, I did see some tree re- redecorating. Yes, yes. The angel got redecorated. First, uh, the angel got replaced. <laughs> uh, the wife was not thrilled. Then she said the angel had to go back up. So the angel went back up, but it got a new hat, which happened to be a uh, TGM koozie as a new hat. And she didn't like that, so she went to get ready for the day. And then the angel got wing protectors, which happened to be (laughs) TGM koozies over each wing. She didn't notice that for the full day of Christmas. (laughs) They made it until the evening. That's awesome. So yes, uh, this is what happens when I get bored and I don't. I'm I'm home because I was on vacation, and, and you're celebrating a holiday you didn't like, don't like in the first place. Yeah, so I'm finding ways to amuse myself. Yeah, you seem to have a semi like minded bah humbug crowd on the TGM and a couple other sites on Facebook there, but by and large, I think you're in the minority. You think so? I think more people don't like christmas than what they actually say i think they well i think they don't like what christmas has become in a lot of ways and like the expectations and the you have to be here and you have to see family and you have to do this and it it does become kind of a big runaround and i can totally understand why people are not thrilled about that yeah so we talked about my christmas and how i just basically terrorized my wife and the angel on top of the tree how was your christmas because you were traveling i was traveling and I kind of was bah humbug in a way as well because we didn't even put a tree up this year. <laughs> now, it wasn't necessarily like out of some sort of anti-Christmas revolt. It was more, we knew where the fake tree was that we've used a couple times in the past. We kind of knew where some of the ornaments were. We had no place to put it because we basically have three sections of the house. We have the complete section that we're living out of, bedrooms and stuff. Yep. We have the in-process section, which is the main living room and dining room. And then we have the, we're not there yet, so it's just going to be junk storage, which is the man cave and the spare bedroom and and that kind of stuff. So it didn't leave a lot of practical places to put Christmas trees and other stuff like that. So, uh, And then there's just the whole time thing. I mean, we kind of talked about it in episode 13. Bam, it was like Christmas all of a sudden. I mean, yeah. last thing I knew, it was 90 degrees outside, and then all of a sudden Christmas was here. So kind of ran out of time. Jenny and I didn't even buy anything for each other. I don't, like, I don't know if I got anything. I don't even know if we I got just ran, anything. Again, we ran out of time. We were talking about it, and she's like, well, what do you want? I said, honestly, I just, don't even worry about me. I'm, I don't even care. I just want to do Christmas with the family and hang out, and I don't. I don't want you spending time like trying to go make something happen. So, oh. see, I did get something. My wife got me this. I just realized that. Oh, I just figured it was standard IU gear from no, working there. They don't give oh, us okay. anything. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and my wife got something because we were sitting on the couch the Sunday before Christmas, and she said something about Christmas and like a gift that she was looking at or something for herself. And I thought all of a sudden, oh crap, I didn't get her anything yet. <laughs> So while we're talking, I already had my laptop out and I was working on some stuff and it's like Amazon, wish list, Just, shoes overnight, go. <laughs> I do have an Amazon wish list. Jenny didn't want to order from it though. She's like, then you'll know what I got you. I was like, I was going to find out in a couple of days anyways, so I'm not really that worried, but... We just put the whole thing off, and we are going to do, um, we're basically just going to go shopping together and kind of have a date night and do something like that, just like outside. Probably, it'll probably be weeks before we even get to that, but we'll be able to catch our breath from the holidays. Mm, good deal. My but, mother-in-law got me brake pads. Nice. For for the, for the UTV. Oh, really? Yeah. It was on my wish list. I, what, I didn't particularly need them yet. 
but I put them on there so that I could remember the part numbers that I needed to order when I did order them. But she saw it on the wish list and was like, well, clearly he needs brake pads. And so I got brake <laughs> That's pads. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I thought she meant those like random brake pads. Like, I don't know if these will fit or not. No, no. They're, they're uh, the EBC race brake pads that I actually will need at some point. Now, I didn't need them yet, but hey, good on her because at least it's something I'll use. Maybe if we needed brake pads, it would have saved tie rods if you no, catch I, my drift. I, I didn't use them anyway. <laughs> No, but little does she know I cut her brake lines. No, teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Three stops, no more brakes. <laughs> so. so the traveling part went well. Uh, it was good to see everybody, and they have significantly more snow back, you know, up north than what we have down here. We've got barely two inches. Down oh here. yeah, and even on Christmas we didn't have no. a quarter inch. I mean, it wasn't. My dad had eight or nine inches, and we were out there. I mean, he was snow blowing, and I was shoveling and touching up, and I didn't mind helping him out. Because you don't good, have to do it here. Because it was a good reminder of, I don't have to do this every day now. Yeah. yeah. Here, Early. it's like we got two inches, and the roads are clear, and they're dry. Yeah. And, you know, you ha- we have some in our driveways. Most of the driveways around here are gravel. So, you know, you don't bother plowing them unless it's really deep, like you're going to get stuck. And we generally don't get that. Maybe once a year. So. Yeah. And my plan on those days is to stay home. Yeah. Because so. nobody down here can drive. That's the other thing I've discovered. Oh, yeah. No, snow. People do not understand slick conditions or snow. No. It, it is completely a foreign thing to them. It's amazing. I'm, I'm, everybody thinks I'm nuts because I'm just zipping around them. Because I grew up up north where Doug lived. And, you know, I'm used to the snow. This is not snow. This is no. like a dusting. That's so. pretty much it. Yep. Well, let's go ahead and start off with Robert Higby. And Robert, I got to admit, we really appreciate the questions and the topics of discussion, and hopefully you're appreciating our answers. Actually, you usually give us pretty good feedback that you're you're happy with. Happy or not happy with, like, we didn't answer the question, which I'm good with. If yeah. we didn't answer the question that you intended, Honestly, if I have one thing on my 2018 wish list, it's for more people to be involved with this podcast. You know, take a second, leave a review if you hate it. Please tell us. If you love it, please tell us. Uh, if you have suggestions, if there's things you want to hear, um, you know, we're doing this because we enjoy it, but we're also doing it because you guys seem to enjoy it. So, you know, this is your chance to get your two cents in. And if we hate what you said, we'll just ignore it. But yep. at least you had your chance. Yep. So Robert Higby said, and this is, there wasn't really even a question mark on it. It just <laughs> says, light bars, discuss them. Uh, you're going to want one, and they basically come from one of two or three places in China. So, honestly, my thought on them is they all last so long because the LED technology has come to the point where even junk ones will last a long time. Yep. Just buy the one you can get the best deal on and slap it on there. <laughs> By the time that thing breaks, you probably will have already gone to like another you know, UTV or something along those lines. In case you guys can't hear that, it is my nephew just rang the doorbell. <laughs> Doug will continue talking about light bars while I let him in. You get, I mean, this is raw and unvarnished. You get exactly what we get, which is real life. And since we're doing this on New Year's Day, uh, pretty much everybody is around. The kids are out of school, spouses, all that kind of stuff. So anyways, you know, I don't mean to uh, belittle certain companies, but there's no such thing as that I'm aware of, and Chad can correct me if I'm wrong, an American-made light bar. They're American-distributed ones. Correct. Um, uh, But they're all coming from China. So really, you're just looking for the deal. And again, I I think by the time you burn one up, you're probably on to your next UTV anyways. Yep. Um, Now, there are some better quality ones, and I'm sure that the same manufacturers have like a grade A and a grade D or whatever. Yeah. Um, And I don't know. Here's my opinion on light bars. They used to be stupid expensive. Oh, yeah. They're like ridiculous. A, a 12-inch one, when I bought my first one, was, I don't know, three or $400. I mean, yeah. It was stupid mm-hmm. expensive. It worked great, but they were so expensive. Now you can get like a 12-inch light bar, we'll say, which is very small. Um, you know, 50 bucks, maybe less. I don't know. I haven't shopped them in a while. Yeah. Um, they are very cheap. Um, and... There's a higher quality one where a 12 inch, we'll say the high quality one in a 12 inch light bar will throw light 
200 yards that's good usable light and the low quality one may only throw it 100 yards or 150 yards or whatever i mean i'm not these aren't real numbers they're just there for argument's sake so there's a better quality one that you can buy and but the price ramping up is so steep and honestly i think given the types of driving that most utv drivers do being out that far i don't know I just don't know if it's worth the money to get the better quality one that shoots out that much further, personally. I, I tend to agree. I think there, there's also a good middle of the road in there, too. One that's pretty good. It's not the cheapest. It's not the best. Um, but like Doug said, most of them are built really well. Um, I had one on my side-by-side before we started racing it. And actually, when a friend of mine rolled it, um, it broke the mounts off. He went over at least one and a half times that I know. He doesn't remember or no it was only going six miles an hour (laughs) yeah that was the word anyway so but he rolled it and it broke it off and everything else and the light bar itself still worked so they're built solid i mean they work so my opinion light bar i think pretty much everybody needs one the only reason i don't have one on mine um was because we're racing and i had no real need for it we didn't typically race at night we would race until it'd start to get maybe what you would call dusk, but headlights almost had no function even when we were finishing up. I mean, you know, it was darker than full daylight, but you didn't need it. No, not really. So for us, we didn't need it on there, and I always just considered it an extra... Uh, it was a risk, because you're going to break... At some point, you're going to break something. If we clip a tree off camber and shove the cage up into a tree or something like that, and it snaps a mount off or um, roll it over and it just breaks a light bar. To me, there is no point in having it on there and a risk of breaking it for something that we weren't going to use anyway. So that's the only reason I never put one back on. I actually had a brand new one sitting in my garage, and I ended up just giving it to my dad because he would use it, and I, I'd had it sitting in my garage for like a year. So I think the only other thing I would add is there are different focus patterns. You can get ones that are more of a spot pattern and ones that are more of a, just like a general a flood. flood pattern. And they do have a mix. They yeah. have ones with spot and flood, which I would say I, most of the people that are listening to this are not racers. They're going to be the guys that are just trail riding and so on and so forth. So I would say if I was going to get one, which I'm sure I will for my next side by side, a one that is about the width of the cage or slightly narrower. I tend to go slightly narrower because if you are off camber and you lean the cage over into a tree, you won't tend to break it off as easily. Right. Um, And so I would say one slightly narrower than the top of your cage or wherever you're mounting it and a combination of spot and flood beam patterns in it. And I think if I was going to light one up, probably what I would like is somewhere in the neighborhood of like an 18-inch flood mounted lower towards the front, like up on the bumper, and maybe a couple 12s or maybe a pair of 18s or something that were um, the more tight focus beam pattern higher up. Well, I've seen several guys that do like a 12-inch on their bumper or push bar or whatever they have, and then do pods on the cage themselves Yeah, and do those... um, so a combination like that, which that's fine. Um, I guess the real answer, you can never have too much light if you're riding a lot at night. I mean, you, you, you almost can't can. if it's killing your alternator and you don't have the power to replenish. Well, well, okay, there is that. Yeah. Um, and the side-by-side that we race is notorious for um, it just doesn't have a strong charging system. I mean, it does okay, but by the – actually – by the time we added power steering, because my unit was not originally intended to have power steering, but I added it. By the time I added that and the CVT blowers and like the temp monitors and all the stuff that we added. We were getting pushy? Uh, at all. We were, we were drawing more than we used. Oh. Um, so in between races, I'd just charge it. Charge the battery, make sure I'd put on a trickle charger. So let's say it's got a 40 amp alternator and from the factory it needs 36 of it's what it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> So you don't, yeah. I guess wiggle room there. You need to make sure that you yeah. you have the charging system to cope. And along those lines, one other thing I would like to point out: a lot of people talk extra batteries. Extra batteries are good for off runtime. Like if you don't have the engine running, let's say you're out sawing wood, you shut the thing down, and you just are using it for light or something like that. That's where the extra battery comes in handy. The extra battery actually just presents a load to the charging system when it's running, though. So 
don't think you're going to put more light bar than you have power for and throw an extra battery in and be okay. You will be short term, but long term, yes. it's it's not a win to do that. You need to upgrade an alternator. Right. And that's why I was saying for us, uh, and I knew that we were overdrawing. That yeah. This was not a question. But for us, because we only run about an hour, I knew that's short term. We we can overcome that with just charging the battery and making sure we're good. Um, I will say, and a lot of people don't do it, it's becoming more commonplace now, but I've done it for the last, I don't know, 10 years probably. Anytime you put a second battery in, anything like these UTVs, put an isolator on them or a battery Definitely. separator, yeah. whatever you want to call them, um, because and hook all your accessories up to your secondary battery. And uh, I always use one, a Sure Power, I think it was a, 1315 I believe was a model number. I'm not sure I could I could look it up. But and if you guys want to know, let me know and I'll find that model number we'll, for we'll you. We'll put a link in the YouTube after we've had time to process this. We'll throw one in there. Yeah, but it's uh that was the brand was Sure Power and what it did was whenever the battery voltage was over I think if it was over 12.9, it would connect the batteries and if it was below that, it disconnected them. Um and then you could you put a secondary wire to it, to this isolator from your ignition, and if you wanted to connect both batteries for starting purposes, it would do that <clears> also. <throat> but that saves you from ever being stranded out there. It's basically your fail-safe. If, you, if you're running radio or lights or something out in the middle of woods and you completely kill that battery, you can get yourself home. Yeah, which is a good thing to have. You, um, I'm not saying don't go with an extra battery, but it is not a a fix for a charging system no. that is not adequate. And a second battery actually does present an additional load to a charging system. It's not much, but you do have to keep that battery up. And as you all know, if you let them sit, they discharge. So if that thing sat for two weeks and you go out and run, you now have to charge both batteries. It's, yeah. So um, it's, it's not a knock on the two battery setup. It's a great idea for a lot of people, but just be aware that it is not a fix for a weak charging system to begin with. And while we're on that topic, I mean, we're, we're talking about power. The other thing I always like to double check and usually beef up is your ground. Yeah. If you've got a ground to the frame or to the engine case or both, those always are worth looking at because a lot of times they get cheaped out on from the factory. Um, especially there, there's more Chinese uh, brands that are coming out besides CF Moto. And there's a Russian one we were going to talk about briefly. And sometimes where you c get corners cut is the stuff you can't see. So yep. if you don't have a good ground, I mean, if you buy a new UTV and you are upgrading anything in the charging system or adding accessories, just take a look at it. Make sure it's an adequate gauge. Also, pull the thing off the frame. Make sure that they didn't just run a zip screw through it and call it good. Make sure that the paint below that ground lug is removed and that you've got good contact there. There's some things you can do that'll really save your bacon out on the trail because a bad ground is probably 60% of the problems people have with electrical systems. The Yamaha Rhinos were notorious for having a bad ground that went from the engine block to the frame underneath the passenger seat. I believe it was under the passenger seat. And uh, man, you'd have all kinds of problems. You just all of a sudden like, oh, my uh, CDI box fried. Yeah. And it was, it was that. And why it, and it was only that link there. It was just an undersized wire. And everyone was like, okay, you take this off and just run a new wire completely. And it was fine. But yeah, um, man, we're getting deeper into electrical theory and everything else <laughs> at this point than light bars. Discuss them. And but here we've good, gone. But it's good. If you're going to, if you're going to slap a big womp and light bar or a pair of them on there, you want to make sure your charging system is up to spec before you hit the trails and find out otherwise. So. I think any more UTVs have really gotten better about anticipate the manufacturers have gotten better about anticipating the addition of accessories well i know like uh the razors now they come with and uh well, a bus bar form yeah yeah it's basically like they've got the uh, almost like the ford puts the upfitter switches in yep. the f-250s and 350s and stuff they're coming prepped like okay here's power yeah they're doing that whereas like okay we we're talking about the rhinos and all that um they the charging systems were like just over enough to operate the machine and you start putting much more than a light bar and you were in trouble and then, well that's why the rhinos had that yeah. alternator kit that you could buy and it was literally a car alternator with bracketry to run a belt off of the fan side so that you could charge it 
I used to have a uh, an old 19, I think it's 74 Honda CB350, little, yeah. little CB series motorcycles. It just had a magneto in it, yep. and it was not enough to run the headlight. If you idled for too long, you'd kill the battery. <laughs> it was discharging unless you were at, I want to say it was like 1,500 or above. Yeah. It was discharging. Yeah. <laughs> so I've I've had worse, but... That, that's how a race buggy was. Yeah, pretty much. And that's why I was like, whenever we started off, I would tell Doug, okay, after we start the machine, and the battery was getting weak towards the end of the season anyway, it was just standing on its last leg. Um, but I'd tell Doug, okay, after we get going and we start for the race and we get to like the first corner, then hit the blowers. Cause at that point we've got RPMs and we're going to be, you know, up. Exactly. So, so that was a really long winded way to say we like light bars. Uh, there are definitely different types, but I really think for the average driver, just look for the one that's the best deal. I don't know that spending more necessarily nets you as much as you spend. I mean, somebody out there is going to argue with me on that because they got one they really like, but I'm just going averages here. Some yeah. people want the best of everything, and that's fine. The average person, even the cheap light bars now, are good enough that they are way more powerful than the stock headlights. Oh, yeah. The stock headlights do not cut it, in my yeah. opinion, at all. Any make, any model, they just don't do it. So, yeah, I would I would say pick up a light bar, even a little 12-inch one or a couple of the, like, uh, three- or four-inch cubes, whatever they are. Um, those are pretty good. But, yeah, a nice little 12-inch one that'll tuck right in your bumper, uh, you'll, you'll wish you had done it from day one. So. Absolutely. Well, we had a little list here that uh, from UT Driver that – we're basically pirating, but we wanted to discuss some of the stuff on there. They kind of did the year-end review for us and and brought out a lot of the things we've already talked about. So, yeah. um, but we wanted to kind of look back at 2017 at some things that had made a difference and things that had come on the market that maybe you'd missed or maybe you've got some opinions about and you are welcome to leave them for us. Now, when I put this together, I told Doug, I said, there's a lot of X3 stuff on here. I didn't do that. They did that. This is a very impressive page, Chad. I'm, I'm glad you made this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh we're just going to start at the top of the list and i don't know if this is reverse order because honestly i don't know that this is the most exciting thing that happened but it's it's number one yeah i don't know how they base their order i, I don't on. feel like this was based on like ooh, it just they started somewhere i think it was based on uh i think they did their list on when they were released like early uh, 2017 yes. to late 2017 but i'm not positive so regardless we're just going to go through this list so caterpillar announced in october that it was going to ask textron to build them two work-based utvs one with a gas motor and one with a diesel motor now don't think like big cat diesel from a semi you better be thinking like a little three-cylinder like kind of a yanmar knockoff or something like yeah. that but um kubota's kind of got them i don't want to say they got the market pegged but they sort of do in that diesel powered utility oh, for the UTV. actual motors yeah like yeah. kubota's really the only one that's making a, a real true diesel powered utility no, UTV there's the and, mule i think it's still the 3010 are they making one? Yeah. Oh, oh they've, they've had one for, oh, man. I didn't know if they still were, I guess. Yeah, they're still making them. And, and I would say that they are, see, I'm not into that market as much, but I would say they're at least even yeah. with Kubota, if not slightly more, just because of all the uh, all the companies out there, like, you know, construction, pipeline, whatever you're doing, they buy those. Yeah. And the uh, little Kubotas, I think they tend to shy away from, although Kubotas have things that the little mules, the 3010s, don't. Oh, yeah. I mean, like you, they you have can PTOs, get PTOs, they have hydraulic hookups. You can get a full and, cab with air conditioning and a radio, and I mean, yeah. you can you can spend $23,000 on a utility. <laughs> I mean, not a sport, just a utility machine, yep. if you really want. That's the foreman car. Yeah. So <laughs> the average slob's not getting that one. So I I never even saw the release of them, but like I said, I ha I really don't pay attention to the utility models, even like the sport slash utility models that do come out, like the general and the yeah well, the general yeah, whatever. But the well, Ranger, I just don't pay attention to them because well, honestly, I know it's Deer's not. got you know their Gators and stuff like that. Cub yeah. Cadets released a couple back in 2016. Yeah, um, but I again I. I think the diesel list is short, so that may be kind of interesting for somebody who's looking for diesel power. But again, don't think this thing's going to be exciting to drive. It's oh, just no. going to be functional. A friend of mine, had, he bought one of the 3010 mules, and that's been no, better than 10 years ago. And I drove it, and I had a normal mule at that time. 
that we had. I remember that, yeah. The little mule that we had. Um, so it was a direct comparison. Now, his was a big four-seater one and all that, but uh, it it did good, man. The thing would haul anything, but it was not fast. It was not exciting, and the suspension was not there. So, you know, it is what it is. If you're looking for uh, a diesel one, well, I guess now Cat has one, and we know that Kubota has one, and we know that Kawasaki has one. So you got a few choices out there. There you go. I don't know we're going to see any of those on the racetrack, but it'd be amusing. No, nope. we did see that uh, Honda yeah. 1000 out yeah. there on the last I race was going to save that because I think that's on this list too. Yeah, but. we'll talk about that later. So, <laughs> All right. I'm just going to do a quick run through here. Slot two, the Can-Am Maverick X3 RC. That's the rock crawler edition. N- number three, the Can-Am Maverick X3 XMR. Yep, you're, that's the mud edition, basically. The Can-Am Maverick X3 900HO. Yep, they're looking for a, one to compete with the 900 Razors. The Can-Am Maverick X3 Trail Max with Smart Lock. That's the big one with basically the full diff locker. And they've got some other Can-Am stuff on here, but let's <laughs> I'm just lumping all the X3 stuff together because we could be here all day. Right. Now, essentially, these a lot of these are the same. Uh, the same power plants in that are in other ones with the XMR and the RC. Uh, those are the same power plants. Suspension-wise, the shocks are tuned slightly different, I believe. Uh, different wheel and tire combinations. Yeah, definitely. Different bumpers and stuff like that, but... I'm just looking at the the tires here on the uh, RC. Those would not play well where we normally ride. No, they're not very closed in, more of an all-terrain truck tire looking. But um, I mean, if you're but for rocks, for slick rock or anything oh, yeah. else, it's great. Slick rock. If you're out in Moab, that thing would be awesome. Right. Um, I'm not saying it's bad. It's just built for something different. Yeah. But a majority of those machines are the same. So anything in the X3 lineup, I tend to like. So. Yeah, and, you know, they bumped them. Uh, they got the horsepower increase from 154 up to 172, and, you know, that they kept going that way. So I thought the 900 HO was an interesting one because they said, okay, not everybody's interested in having a ton of horsepower. They just want a competent machine. So they want the right. suspension travel. They want the cockpit layout. And so then they kicked the 900 HO out, which also brought with it a not quite as low a price tag as I was thinking it was going to, but it definitely chopped some off versus the the full-fledged turbo, you know, beast. So I like that move. I think it's going to serve some people well um, because let's the 900 HO is no slouch. I mean... No, no, it's not. And really, the 900 motor for most people is more than enough. Oh, yeah. Um, Most people don't just drive them full bore. Judging by the amount of wrecks we've seen on Copart and IAAI and other, you know, insurance outlets like that, the 1000 Turbo is way more than most people need. It's way more than they can handle. (laughs) Uh, More money than driving skill. I I have seen more wrecked X3s than I would ever believe would be coming out. Because in my mind, I guess in my mind, I had imagined that it would be a progression. People would buy the X3 if they'd previously had a Razor or a Maverick, and they wanted bigger and faster. Right. Like, they wanted the next progressive step, and I don't think it's gone to that. I think it's gone to, I have money. I'm buying the most expensive thing. Like, you know, someone who has a good job or whatever, and, well, I've seen, like, YouTube channels, and I'm a subscriber to one YouTube channel of a guy who had never had an off-road vehicle, period, at all, and went and bought an X3. So literally 0 to 100. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a great machine. I'm not saying the guy can't drive or whatever else, but he had had, like, street cars and stuff, like muscle cars, and I think he had a Porsche or whatever at some point. And so it, he, you know, probably understands driving at speed better than the, the Prius owner out there, but it's a different skill set off-road. Oh, it's completely different. Now, he lives up in Michigan. He's done a lot of his stuff, like, in Silver Lake, the sand dunes there, and some Michigan's got some wide-open trails, and they're really not hills there, so you, it's hard to mess it up. I mean, you got to really overcook a corner to wipe one out, But he, and he hasn't yet. I'm not saying anything like that. It's just I've seen more wrecked ones, and I think a lot of it has lent itself to you go into the dealership, and instead of the salesman saying, well, here's the... $15,000 Maverick that is still way faster than what a majority of people need. They're like, well, here's the $25,000, you know, X3 full 
one that looks like Iron Man and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the gold and the black and the red. It looks like Iron Man. It does. Sorry. It really does. Um, so, and they're like, oh, I need the best. It's got better suspension, more travel, and it's faster and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they the salesmen have a great way to sell it, I'm sure, because, well, it's, you know, 100 and, well, say they're selling the new one. It's 172 horsepower. Your car, your truck has, you know, 400, so you can surely handle this. It's a different world altogether. Oh, yeah. So... I mean, no offense to the good salesmen out there, but yeah, you're going to get sold the bill of goods. And yeah. it, it's, I cringe, you know, I'm big into camping and I've owned quite a few campers and I can't tell you how many times I've seen people go, well, my, my truck, it's a smaller truck. It's got a V6 and it'll tow 6,000 pounds. My camper weighs 5,800 empty. So I should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Forget about that wood you put in it and the water and... Your family, because they count against your... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, family. <laughs> and then try, you know, and then, okay, tow it on the flat ground. Yeah. Fine, you can get it to move. Now take it over the mountains, because yeah. I've been out west several times. I've been over the Eisenhower Pass with a 32-foot-long, you know, 8,000-pound travel trailer. You need some juice if you're going to do that. Yeah, and those trucks are wheezing at that altitude. Oh, yeah. I mean... Yeah. So, yeah. so the interesting one to me, honestly, is the Trail Max with Smart Lock, simply because the thing is enormous. <laughs> I mean, I, out in the dunes, in the wide open, it would be a blast. That thing would be a nightmare in most of the trails that you and I frequent. Oh, yeah. Um, I, and I, every time I see one in a dealership or anything else, like I see one in person, I am always amazed at the size of it again. It's huge. It's Every like time a I see it, yeah, I call it a school bus. Yeah, <laughs> I was it, trying to be nice. It's short bus. It is the short, <laughs> <laughs> the short fun bus though. Yeah, it is. But yeah, I mean, if if, if you, you have wide open, it would be a hood. Oh, it would be the machine to have. <clears throat> but I would not want to have any four seater. I'm not saying that one. Any four seater. We I know, just, we I know you're not, antisocial. Well, yeah, but I, I wouldn't, if I was just going somewhere to cruise with my family and that's all I was doing, okay. But then for anything else that I like to do, which is ride fast and push a machine to its limits, it would fall so short that it would, in my, okay, in my opinion, if you buy the four-seater and you want to ride fast, it's like buying a two-seater and expecting to take your family. Yeah, it's, it is, it's it is completely the, the wrong machine, machine for, for it. Yeah, yeah. I'm just, uh, I'm just curious because I honestly have not seen one in the wild. I'm, oh, have you not? Uh, I mean, uh, there's videos and stuff, but I haven't seen one like in person in the. I mean, well, no, I've seen them in the showroom. I haven't okay. seen them out like on the trail. I haven't seen somebody like wedged in a weird spot with one. But you have I'm to waiting. have legitimate trails for yeah. them. I mean, they're they're just big. <clears throat> they're, I mean, they handle good. They ride good, and everything else is big. They're just big. I, this is not the machine for me. I I have no desire to own one. So, so further down the list, we've got the Can Am Maverick Trail, which is their new fifty inch wide model that they've just introduced. Uh, kind of competes in the same market as the the Razor Nine Hundred, their Trail, their fifty yeah. inch. Um, not much to say much to say about it, except for I like the fact that it comes with a lot of standard equipment. It comes with a roof. It comes with a winch. Um, it's got uh, decent body armor on it, rock sliders and that kind of stuff out of the gate. It's got a rear hitch thing, got a rear hitch, think, uh, which the Polaris's do not. So really, um, for about the same money, and we ran down the specs in episode probably um, like three or four. It's pretty early on. They're neck and neck. I yeah. mean, horsepower is the same. Suspension travels within a half an inch. I mean, it really comes down to if you like the ergonomics of the cab better, which I do because I've seen one. And you get some extra goodies in there, so now, I like I, it. I don't know if it's going to turn the diehard crew away from the Razor because there's so much aftermarket support, but I think it's a, you know, if you are getting into that market and you really want a narrow machine, I like it. I watched a Dirt Tracks episode of, they were comparing the two, and for anybody that's watched Dirt Tracks, they everyone knows that they are, well, they're sponsored by Polaris first. And they are Polaris guys, through right. and through, 100%. And they even, I don't remember if they said that the Maverick won or if the Polaris won, but it was like pretty well dead even. They gave fit and finish to the Maverick. Um, 
they liked the suspension better on the Polaris, but it was it was really more of a preference right. at that point. It wasn't that they said the Maverick rode bad. They just didn't like how it... They were used to how the Polaris reacted. Um, but I really like that thing. Uh, I don't think it looks as good as all their other machines out there. It looks a little bug-eyed. I, I, as I'm scrolling down through it, it's it looks like the slightly uglier cousin of the... <laughs> Of the Honda Pioneer here. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm looking at it, but yeah, I'm not crazy about the looks either, but honestly, I have no interest in a 50-inch machine. I, I really don't. really don't I, either. I can't deal with the lack of suspension travel. No. So 60 it, inches as narrow as I want to go. Yeah. And I mean, re- you can suck them in by rims and tires and stuff, but when you start shortening suspension components, you know, A-arms are shorter, that yeah. kind of stuff, I'm just not super interested. Yeah. But that's just me. Uh, I think it's a great machine. I think it'll do fine. I don't know if it'll unseat Polaris. I think there's enough aftermarket support to for just for people to justify buying them. Um, I just there's just obviously not near as many choices in the aftermarket. So right. we'll say there's like three companies that make a bumper for the that pull or for the Maverick Trail. Well, there's 50 that make it for the Polaris. Or now um, these are made up numbers again, but I think. What I'm hearing is we need to look at that as eminent performance. <laughs> I just can't keep buying side-by-sides all the time. Why not? Because my wife yells at me. I don't want to hear your excuses. Go buy one. <laughs> you buy one. <laughs> no, I don't want to hear my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so Honda made a few upgrades to their uh, flagship 1000 Pioneer. Basically, they've got an electronically c- controlled brake manipulation system. So think of it kind of like uh, the traction control that's been in a lot of trucks and stuff for a while now and cars where it can it can do more braking than you can because it can do individual wheels yep. versus just all or nothing. Um, so that would be useful, especially like in a downhill situation. Tires are skidding and that kind of stuff. It's not really descent control, but it's going to help keep you straight and from doing well, weird things. Well, it keeps you from over-rotating the machine. Right. And so while we're here, because we were talking about this earlier, there was a guy who raced the 1000 version in the last race of the season in the series that we ran. Yeah, did great, actually. He did great. And I really, really do attribute a lot of that to that exact new thing, that that traction control, as it were. Um, I was impressed how it looked on the track. I saw him go around quite a few times, and he knew how to drive it. Oh yeah, no, you know, props to the racer himself. But I think looked, it was it looked really competent. Well, I was I was surprised. But all of a sudden, you turn that traction control off. What would he have done? Because no other machine out there had traction control. Doesn't matter. He had it. That's the I, point. I, oh, I agree. <laughs> I'm saying I'm the machine yeah. did great. Yeah. He, you know, he did fine. I'm not. There's nothing <laughs> against that. I'm just saying. The the machine did more of the driving for him than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah, maybe so. Because you can overcook those corners and everything else, and that's what takes you out of the race right there. True. Because there's zero room for error. Is I this mean, where I can talk about the brakes on the the race buggy? If you <laughs> you want. need more than pads. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, that thing has terrible brakes. It does. I mean, horrible. I've looked at a whole new master master cylinder and everything else. Yes, yeah. we're. We're doing something that about that. That was my that. jab. <laughs> okay. But I, I'm laughing and, to myself here at this picture, though. They've got the netting up and everything. It looks like netting. It looks like something, and I'm not talking race netting. I'm talking like bug netting. It looks like something from the next Jurassic Park yeah, movie. I was like, going to say it's a raptor enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> it, I can just picture people in the back like holding guns up and you know shooting darts at dinosaurs out of it. <laughs> Yeah. It's not uh, a bad look. It's just an interesting one. I think they overplayed the utility Bushman theme <laughs> bit. Yeah, just a bit. Um, it, it, whatever. It kind of has that like Defender 90 feel about it now. <laughs> See, anybody who's had anything and uses their utility vehicle, and this is not, those are not race vehicles. They're sport slash utility, more utility. How many people leave those stinking nets up? None. You're going to have to take that net down every time you want to throw firewood in the bed or, you know, whatever. That's the thing. You're in and out of it. That's the one, pardon me, the one downfall we talked about the X3 is it's designed to be sat in for long periods of time. The way you use yours when you're not, you know, out trail riding, you need to be in and out of it. Yeah. And so same thing. Yeah. The net's going to be in the way and they won't last. See, they even got the nets on the 700 here. Yeah. 
they really like those. Yeah, no thanks. I mean, they're they're great machines. Honda makes a very reliable machine. Typically, they underpower them so that the engines last a little longer, which is where they get their reliability. And they're smooth and they're well engineered. Um, yeah. There's no knocks at them. They just don't try to push that ragged edge of every horsepower gained. That's, yeah, that's really kind of Honda's trademark period. I mean, I wouldn't say that about the 450s because obviously the, the 450 quads, that well, they, 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 they no longer making. make. Yeah, they no longer make them, but that's, you know, they knew that was a race machine right. and they pushed hard because they had to compete. But most of the stuff they make, they are conservative with it. But again, they're looking for hours on this thing. Right. And I agree. It, it's built for that purpose. So they did exactly what they were going for. They accomplished it. So so its little brother, the 700, now has a paddle shifter. Yeah, I saw that. The 1000 had it a couple years ago. So now they bumped that down to the 700, and now the 500 gets an auto mode. The paddle shift, but it gets an auto mode. So basically, they push all the technology down a tier. I... We've talked about this before. The the quad that I rode this year doing the track sweeping had, was a basically a paddle shifter without the paddles. It was push button shifter. I'm not a fan of it. I just <laughs> well, it was really confused about when it wanted to shift at times. Yeah, you'd be in second and you'd let off the throttle and third. Nope, still in second. Third. third. Nope, still in second. Third. Okay, now it's shifted. It did that when it was cold too. It, when the oil was thick, it didn't want it didn't to shift kick, at all. Didn't want Remember to that kick last it. race oh, when it was like fifteen to twenty degrees outside? Yeah, I had to let it idle for like a half an hour before I could get it to shift. <laughs> I jumped on it to move it. It yeah, it would not move out of first. It's like yeah. that's all you get. Yeah, uh, I just don't. I'm not a big fan of the shifting. Um, how often do you really need to hold it in second gear? We'll say. On a UTV. Well, but on a utility UTV. Do you want that belt smoking? No, that's why you have low range. That's true. If you're going to tow, you put it in low range, it will adjust for you. That, and that's my point. How often do you need to hold in second gear and second gear only? Why, why can't you just put it in low and let it be in low? I suppose so. And then that's my opinion. Because it's just more technology and more things to go wrong and more things that are troublesome... I mean, even on the quad that I rode, it's just more things that are troublesome. Uh, how many times did I, I just wish the stupid thing was belt-driven? I'll put two belts on it a year. I don't care. But <laughs> just the shifting was just obnoxious. Yeah. So, Especially whatever. for what you were doing, you know, trying to track sweep and that kind of stuff. And watching all these guys with much bigger machines that had belts on them and everything. And yeah. they had an easier time of it. So, that's my opinion on that. A good machine, just not for me. So here are two words you will never hear side by side. Sporty mule. Yep. But they use those two words side by side in this ad. So Kawasaki came out this year, uh, 2017, last year, I guess. I got to remember that with the, what was it called? It was the FXR or the, the Pro, Pro FXR, FXR um, which is, it's still a bench seat. Three seater. Yep. Bench seat. It had like little half doors on it. They call it a true dual sport. Uh, it is not. I'm it's sorry. Right. No, it's it not is not. Close. It Kawasaki, is a, you are wrong. It is a great utility vehicle. They are well made. They are reliable. The third, the wider bench is nice. You're, it's not a sport vehicle. Let's not even play around. They put aluminum wheels and half doors and graphics. Look, it's got stripes on it. It's got racing stripes. Dude, the stripes, that's like five miles an hour right there. Oh, yeah. It gives you at least that. <laughs> I, it's just not. I no. No. It. You can't just add things like aluminum wheels and graphics and call it a sport. It doesn't work. No. So my opinion, whatever. But I, I guess I guess they are correct. It is the most sporty one. But it, yeah, it is. But everyone's trying to push that. Everyone wants to think they're buying something that's fun and fast, and it's they're just workhorses. It's not so, why you're buying that machine. That would be a great machine if. All you did was drive around your, you know, flat property out like an open field or barn lots or whatever, and you wanted to get back your down your trails to go deer hunting and haul the deer out. That is a great machine for it. Yeah, absolutely. If you are looking for anything even remotely fun that you can go out and push, that is completely the wrong machine. So, and... Speaking of fun, let's get to the next one because I really am interested to see this one. And I'm going to contact our uh, 
our connection who's a Textron dealer and see when they get one in. Cause this is one of the very first things we talked about on the one of the very first podcasts we did was the fact that Textron uh, bought out Arctic Cat and decided to start doing some fun stuff like putting Yamaha engines with CVT transmissions and um, they've got King Shocks, they've got really, really beefy axles that you're just not going to break, uh, two-point trailing arms. Uh, I'm, I'm excited too, honestly. So the machine is called the Textron Wildcat XX. I don't know if they're calling it the Double X or whatever they call it. I'm really but, glad they didn't call it the Triple X. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, but the thing just looks tough. It's already got a... Now, from what we've seen, you know, production models come out and some things change. It's got a nice low cage line that already looks good. It doesn't need chopped looking. No, I like um, it. It looks, it's basically the Can-Am, the Maverick, the X3. It yeah. looks like a race machine. I mean, it's kind of swoopy. Yeah. This just is a little more chiseled and brawny looking is the best way to describe yes. it. Yes. Um, I like the I like the Yamaha engine. And that's my one beef with, when we get to the end of this episode, we'll discuss what you and I have been discussing mm -hmm. over the last week or so about that. But, um I like the Yamaha engine, but I like that they've put the CVT in it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm really excited to see that. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to get a hold of our Textron contact, who is a dealer, and see um, see if we can come take a look at one if he ever gets look, one look. in. Look? <laughs> I want to do more than look. Well, yeah. You better twist his arm harder than that. I'll, I'll, I'll twist. Okay, we're going to run through some of this other stuff because I'm not super excited. Okay, there's the Polaris Ace 150. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is a little tiny 150. It's basically for kids. They make the 170 Razor, yeah. um, which my nephew got one for Christmas. Um, it's cute. Yeah, they're it's neat. Fun. But it, the 150 is a single-seat version of it. It's yep. only two-wheel drive. Uh, I've been underneath the 170, and I'm sure the 150 is nearly identical. It's a go-kart. It's a go-kart. I mean, it, there's no wheels. four wheel drive. Yeah. Uh it has headlights, there is no taillights. It's a sticker for the cluster thing. It's it's a go-kart. It's cute. It's yeah. fun and I'm I'll be honest if I was a kid I'd be thrilled, but as an adult, it yeah, there's no way. My kids are too big to fit in that thing anymore anyways. Yep. Uh, I don't know. I fit in that 170 Razor barely. <laughs> I sat in it. <laughs> Did you completely collapse the suspension? No. I look like a one of those circus gorillas or bears on a little tricycle, you know? <laughs> nice. Oh, let's see. Uh, Polaris, they released the Ranger. It's the second XP-1000 was announced. Uh, it's a new platform with new suspension, cockpit, and bodywork. Uh, again, the Rangers are their workhorses. So, uh, sport slash, well, I would say they're more utility. If you're going to say utility. sport utility, the general. Yeah. So, exactly. yeah, it's a utility one. With Basically, the XP, it's got some suspension movement to it, and you can kind of get out there a little bit better. Picture the Ford Raptor from 2014, and that's what the front of it looks like. Yep. Uh, they've got they, they the, did the North Star, the North Star edition. edition which yeah, that's one with heat and air. Um, Enclosed, like full glass cab, windshield if gonna, wiper. If you're going to spend long hours and days in one, like we'll, like we said, working on for a pipeline crew, yeah, or you're a farmer. That's the one you want. Uh, given the weather we've had recently, I want one right now. But yeah, uh, what else we got here? The Razor XP Turbo Dynamics Edition, which we talked about at length, so we won't kill it here. But that's the one that's got the adjustable suspension. However, it is not like fully ferrofluid magnetodynamic. It's basically just uh, it's got electronically actuated valves in there, so right. we can adjust preload and rebound on the fly. But this is not. This is not some fifty thousand dollars suspension system they've thrown in this thing. It's it's neat, and uh, I've never ridden in one, so we kind of beat that horse to death. Though we basically yeah. agreed we don't like it because we run them hard and we want to know exactly what it's going to do every time I go into a corner. I don't want a computer deciding that for me. Yeah, but for some people that may be, you know, they're running the dunes and then they want to go off into a trail. They hit a button, it readjusts it, and maybe that makes them happy. But yep, good enough. Just not for me. Uh, what else we got on here? That just the four seater version, the, four of the same thing. The, the bus version with the Dynamics. Yeah. Uh, oh yes, this one actually was kind of an interesting move for Yamaha because it was. See, you say it, that, but I'll let you finish that, and then I'll say 
Here's I'll why I say it was you. interesting because it wasn't really an admission of fault, but it kind of was an admission of fault. <laughs> it was, and that's why I I so completely am against them selling this as an aftermarket thing. Yes. If you're admitting it's a problem, put it in straight away. So what we're talking or make about, a different addition, like Can Am has the XMR, yeah. or Razor has the high lifter with the gearing reduction. Make a Yamaha YXZ with the tag or torque assisted gearing. Yep, tag. So, um, so that's what we're talking about is the torque assisted gearing for the uh, YXZ 1000R. So basically make a YXZ that, in my opinion, they should have made a YXZ that we'll call it like the East Coast. Yeah. version with the tag system in it and then make a west coast version with the normal gearing that they've been running because so many people had so many problems with the gearing in those things so basically what they did is they dropped the first gear about 70 percent they dropped the rest of them about 30 percent um so it gets out a whole lot quicker uh you can stay up in the power band because really that's the problem is that motor is a it's a twister not a torquer You've yep. got to have some RPM behind it. This allows you to stay in the sweet spot much, much better. Um, I th See, I don't think it was a failure simply because I think they intended people to use these differently than they did. Yeah, okay. But how many people out... You, they pictured like people out in the salt flats, you know, like you see in the movies, just like running and skipping over little bumps in them and that kind of stuff. And I, Very few people do that, though. But yeah, I, but I almost feel like that's was maybe their vision for this and then people were putting them in the woods saying these things are junk I well mean, they're burning clutches out is what a lot of people did yeah um so yeah it i think they still handled it wrong so anyway moving on yeah uh and then we're just going to skip that well it's the last one anyways i think my beloved yamaha wolverine x4 i like it because it is kind of a mix of sport and utility uh, the new motor breathes some life into it. Basically, it gives you about probably about the same performance as the old motor on the two-seater lighter version. Um, but I think it's a competent platform. They ride really well from the factory. They've got the suspension really well sorted out. Now you can take your family, you can fold the seats forward and do some utility work with it. And it's still relatively narrow and short. See, you can get this through a trail. See, my opinion on it, I think they... They did a good thing. I don't think it's a bad machine. I, I'm sure it rides great. Like you said, the motor, they kept the same performance of the two-seater one by giving it more power, but the weight increase kind of negates it. But to me, the new has worn off of it already. Um, it's a Wolverine. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging amazing. the Wolverine, but it's not the one you're going to buy if you want the latest, greatest technology and styling, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a good, solid middle yes. of the road pick it does many things well it doesn't do anything exceptionally that's where i think yamaha's gone lately though with everything i used to be a huge yamaha fan and they just they haven't done anything really great or stand out lately and, and people will say oh the yxz is a whole it's a new driving experience and everything else it's it's not for every they didn't build a good machine that works for everybody they built like you said that dune skipper is what right it was and the Wolverine, okay, it's a good trail machine, but it's not fast. Everyone wanted something with a bigger motor. They haven't done it, and I don't know why they won't do it. Uh, accountants are involved in looking at numbers and like, we're selling these, so we're going to keep selling. I don't yeah. know. I don't know either. I don't know if they don't want to go head-to-head -head with Polaris and Can-Am. They're kind of like, we can nibble into the periphery, because let's face it, if there's a big three, they're the distant third. Right now, yeah, but they were the original ones that brought something to market. <clears throat> and people love Yamaha. They have a cult following. Yeah, but what was the original thing they brought to market? It was the Rhino. Okay, but and that's basically they've stayed there. Like, that, that's that been kind of their bread and butter. That's is what I'm that, saying. They never evolved from that. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. I don't know if they just don't want to or if they've got something wicked up their sleeve that they're just not. But I don't get any indication that that's no, happening. No, I've, I've kind of... The Viking's kind of more of the same. It's basically... a big wolverine yeah they're great machines there's nothing no. wrong with them no they're extremely competent at what they do they're just they're not flashy you're right it's it's run by accountants nothing is exciting <clears throat> nothing is amazing nothing is new yamaha's a huge company and all i can believe is they're happy with the numbers they're getting they don't want to spend a bunch of money to research and get into another market that they don't think is going to be particularly profitable because they're making a killing on sport bikes and band instruments and I don't know how many other million things do they do. Uh, they do a lot. So, um, 
One thing we do need to get to Which that we said we were going to talk about later is was ergonomics and yeah. decisions. So I've I've been kind of semi shopping UTVs, uh, just looking around right now. Still, and we've hinted about this in previous shows. With Chad, looking is never free. No, no, it's <laughs> not. So I have not bought anything yet. Um, I am waiting. I'm just. I okay. narrowed it down. Doug even mentioned to me that he goes, "Well, if you want to go in on an X3," and my heart skipped a beat. <laughs> <laughs> I I did I I. I don't know if I'd been drinking that day or what, but and I said, what was my answer? I said, we can go in halves on an X3 and you know, we'll, we'll make this thing work. Your answer was no. And why? It, it's almost like I'm reasonable. It is. I, I've, I'd like to think that I've been rubbing off on you these four months I've been down here. <laughs> Sucker. Well, here's the thing. We obviously are getting into the, Mark, you know, the, trying to get in the market of aftermarket performance parts for some of these machines. And the X3 is really solid as it comes from the factory. No, we just don't think a lot of people are going to be buying them and then immediately beefing up components because they're either solid enough to hold up or, as we've seen, they've smoked a tree and completely blown the thing up and no amount of aftermarket stuff would have saved you. Right. Uh, the other thing is we want to be able to get in and out of it, and we want, uh, as crazy as this sounds, because we're still looking at, like, Maverick 1000 turbos, <laughs> but if the kids want to drive it. I, I don't know how how much I'll let kids drive any 1000. But I, No, but under supervision, but again, if we're kind of doing that, again, the just the ergonomics, it, the Maverick makes more sense, and I think, you know, what we had been talking about was there's going to be a better availability to possibly develop and make parts and, and do that sort of thing on a Maverick that, rather than an X3. And we even talked about, yes, yeah, so I will fully admit it, I turned down an X3. It, he, it, he had somebody going in halves with him. It, so I, You literally could have knocked me over with a feather. I know, it's crazy, and I still want one, but <clears throat> it is completely not the right machine for me right now. No. So, and I'm... I'm self-aware enough that i realize that as much as i still want one uh so my next choices were down to the yxz or basically the maverick i and i'm sorry polaris owners i don't like them i just don't like them it's like i don't like a glock handgun i shoot them well but every time i shoot a glock i get slide bite right there because of the way i grip it and i don't it's just me uh, I don't like the Polarises. I don't like the way they sit. Their seats look like they're high bolster and ho- really supportive. They wiggle like it's Bill Cosby's Jello ads. I mean, it <laughs> yeah, just, but- they're not solid built seats. They're just not. They're not the machine for me. So anyway, the Polaris was completely out the window. I don't want one. It wouldn't. I wouldn't be happy with it. And so you actually posed the question to me. Okay, would you get a Maverick or a YXZ and why? And, and again, it came down to the same thing: practicality. Yep. The the Maverick is a better all around machine, and neither one has a bed. I mean, really, yeah. you can kind of put a backstop on it, and it'll kind of work as a bed. Ish. But <clears throat> again, if we are going to let any of our kids ride this thing at any point, again under supervision, uh, the paddle shifter is not a big selling point on the YXZ. Uh, you already don't like the fact that they're doing the torque assisted gearing that you feel like you'd have to change it or. I mean, you can buy one from the factory now with that, but that's like a limited edition, much more expensive one that already has it put in. The Maverick just, it ticked all the boxes. You still have a lot of horsepower. You're still a turbo machine. Uh, I mean, people are racing these things and doing quite well with them, but you can get in and out of it. It's going to be, I think it's going to be better on the trail if you're in and out helping people doing that kind of thing. I, I just ergonomically overall i would rather have that than the yxz and i watched a review of a guy who's owned a yxz for the last year and a half he's uh the side-by-side blog guys i've watched their videos too um and he made a statement which really shocked me and i didn't really think about it as much as when he until he said it but he said it'll go everywhere the others will go because his friend has a 1000 razor and another one had a wildcat and just got an x3 said it'll go everywhere but instead of crawling up a rock ledge he said you go from first to second hammer and just slam the thing into the rock ledge 
and that's how you get it up there. Mm, he yeah, said the there's... suspension holds it, the motor and everything else, it holds together fine. He said he's had no problems out of it. But it's not, I'll crawl up this rock ledge or anything else. He said, you slam the thing into the rock ledge, and it will go up it. And that's and the only way to drive it. everything in your body is screaming, don't do it that way. Right. Um, so it's just... It's not the machine that I think I want. If I was just running it out in my open field, it would be great. But to take it other places, I don't think it's it's just not right. I mean, the the transmission is what really lets me down, which is why I really want to see the Textron Wildcat Double X. Absolutely, because it's the engine that I like. I don't mind the high revs. I don't like the transmission that they put in it. So. And so we may be changing our mind from, it just depends. We don't even have a firm release date yet. So in 2018, they're going to re- release it, but it could be like the end of the year. Yeah. We're looking for something to get into a project vehicle for eminent performance. So, um, and I'll put this out over the air so I can hold her to it. My wife has actually already given me the green light for going in halves on something. Yeah. Well, like, my it's, wife it's is done. thinking about it more. I've talked to her about it. She wants a sunroom built. So that's my leverage right now. <laughs> you know, uh, Harbor Freight sells those, uh, carports, the carports that just have the plastic over them. They're like 170 bucks. I'll buy like a roll of Visqueen. We'll yeah, dra- drape done. it over. Done. <laughs> it's a little chilly. She, my wife's yelling from the other room. You guys can't hear <laughs> I'll throw a salamander out there for her. Throw an <laughs> it'll, extra coat on, dear. <laughs> it'd be awesome. Well, that's kind of the the quick 2018. It covered a lot of the same ground that we did, but we wanted to go over the, the kind of the 2017, I should say, year in review about what's coming up. There's a lot of neat stuff coming up in 2018 as well, but I don't think it would be... This is actually the first podcast of 2018. Yes. But I, it's kind of finishing up 2017, and I really don't think it would be complete without a stupid stuff with Chad. Okay. So we have to do that, and we still have to do trivia, because I prepared it. Oh. Man, we're already getting long. Well, I know. It's a New Year's special. Okay. We'll, we'll just run through it. We'll make it quick. Uh, so I'll, I'm picking one. I'll pick one this time. One okay. that I can tell pretty quick and still be semi-entertaining. <laughs> so the jet boat. I was, the one I was hoping for. Really? Yes. Okay. So I had a jet boat. I'm trying to remember what model it was. I believe it was like the Sea Doo Jazz or whatever they were. Yeah. Um, and basically, it's a large jet ski. I mean, that's what they are. Um, it seated I don't know, four people or whatever. I didn't have it long, several months, and that was about it. Um, so we have a pond here, uh, pond lake. You know, it's all by definition. It's about four acres, four and a half acres. Um, and the thing wasn't, the jet boat wasn't running quite right. So, and we've done this before with boats, like we, uh, body shop, we fixed up boats and stuff like that. So to kind of work on it and test it because it's a jet boat and the thing sucks a ton of water, we'll just go put it in the pond. I mean, sure. And it's, it's a four acre <clears throat> pond. So it's big enough that you can, you know, start it and run it and, you know, give it some gas and see how it's acting. So my dad is out in the jet boat with my brother and he's messing with it because I had backed them into the lake or into the pond, whatever. So they're out there and dad's kind of gassing it and everything. Cause it was kind of falling on its face when you gassed it and he couldn't, none of us could figure out why. So he, uh, he's out there and he's trying to like gas it and spin it a little bit. Cause you know, you can spin a jet boat or a jet ski the same way. Right. So he would get it going fast and spin it because he didn't really have room to slow down at the end of the lake by the time it got up to speed, because those weren't amazingly fast. Well, he went to spin it, and it didn't gas like he thought. (laughs) And he got to the dam at the end of the uh, lake there and just launched my boat clean out of the the lake. (laughs) And the bad thing was my brother was in the boat, too, and a tree kind of stopped his face. (laughs) It not... (laughs) <laughs> it See, knocked, I never heard this story. I didn't oh, even really? know you. I didn't actually. I never knew you owned a jet boat. Yeah, so I didn't that's why I saw it on the list. I was like, "What is that?" So yeah, when Dad jumped it out, and it was not like, "Oh, it's you know nosed up on shore." It's out of the water. water it's yeah. up on the dam, which is I don't know three or four feet above the water level, and it's out of the water. And but my brother, that he hit a tree, and it wasn't real big. I'm going to say it was uh, at the base. It was eight or ten inches around. But it's a solid tree. And he hit it right with his face. It knocked out like two or three teeth. <laughs> so 
we're all standing there watching my oh, mom nice. and uh you know i think it was my brother's wife there i know my wife was there um several of us were there my basically half the family or all the family was standing there and they watched my dad shoot my boat up out onto the land and Josh smashed his face into the tree, and they had to take him in for like emergency dental surgery and everything oh, else. Geez. And then I got to get the boat out of the out of the trees and back into the water so I can get it over to where it goes. So yeah, that was that fun <laughs> story. Ended up all it really was the reason that we thought it was running bad, and the reason he couldn't spin it was the set screw that holds the throttle <clears throat> was loose, and the it's, cable, oh. the rod was sliding that was on it? the butterfly. That was it. Nice. So the boat ran great. <clears throat> I thought Just, you were going to say there's a dead woodchuck in the jet or something. Nope, no. Nope, okay. No, nope, that was it. So, yeah, that was uh, my dad jumped my jet boat out of my lake and up onto the dam and smashed my brother's face into a tree with it. <laughs> there's my summary. <laughs> so, that, that was a quick one I could tell. And oh, nice. These are the there, things that happen There's always something like this here. happening around here. Exactly. So, I'm a little scared but for my future, but yeah, well, we'll welcome. have stories. I still got most of my teeth. Eve? All right, trivia. Okay. Trivia. Make it happen. Trivia with Doug. You ready? Some are easy, it. some are hard. Okay. I'm just going to say that every time, whether it's true or not. <laughs> so, as of 2005, uh, where was the most wine consumed in the world per capita? Uh, bum, bum, ba, dum, ba, China. No. Vatican City. What, because there are like three people there? <laughs> communion. Yeah, oh, they that's serve true. communion there all the time. <clears throat> the reason I said China was... The uh, number of people? Well, th- they're like... It, 2005 is a little early, but I heard some report recently, like in the last five years, their wine consumption is through the roof. Yes, I've heard that. Like, I've heard that they kind of mirror the U.S. Yeah. Like as far as trends and popularity, China yeah. does, not the Vatican City. <laughs> <laughs> If the Vatican City does, we might have the like there, next transgender pope or something. There's other issues. Okay. Uh, next. So, yep. Uh, what country has the world's most vending machines per capita? I don't know why per capita is in there's a lot, but whatever. <clears throat> the Vatican City. No. <laughs> is that really your answer? No, it's not. <laughs> yes, that's where they put the communion in vending machines. I'm going to say Japan. Yes. Very good. High population density, and man, they have vending machines for all sorts of creepy stuff. For everything, yes. I've got a friend of a friend who teaches English to, like, Japanese businessmen. He, You know, he's American, grew up here, but as soon as he was 18, graduated, well, he had to graduate college, so like 22 or whatever. But he was always fascinated with the Japanese culture, went over there, and man, some of his stories, like, first-person stories... What the heck, Japan? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that going on. All right. Which country grows the most potatoes? Stereotypically, Ireland. <laughs> Without being racist. This okay. is like overall. Uh, I'm, 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 uh, it's not rated in pounds. I don't have anything like that. But I'm saying the most potatoes. I don't know, but like Russia would not surprise me. Russia? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. They, they do a lot of farming in of potatoes. potatoes. Yeah. Well, they grow underground. I mean, exactly. It'll, you can it'll... grow them in like pretty crappy climates and they still grow. Yep. I love potatoes. They're like my favorite. Man, I'm nailing this. Yeah, you're doing good so far. How many bathrooms are in the White House? All of them. Yes. I need a number, Douglas. Oh, um, 42. 32. I just picked that 42 is the answer to life, universe, and everything yeah. from yeah, Hitchhiker's from, Guide to the Galaxy. I had no idea. 32. 30, it seems that's, low. It does seem low. I thought the exact same thing, because you think how many people actually work in there? Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, I don't know how many people do actually work in there, but, you know, there's, uh, like, cooks, and there's waiters, and there's maids, and there's people that give the tours, and they have tours in there and everything else. And all like the White House aides and everything else. That's not a lot of bathrooms. Thirty-two. Especially the amount of crap in that place right now. Well, yeah, <laughs> they, they have a twelve-foot sewer main running out of that place to get it all moving out. Yeah, it just runs right down the street at Congress. Yep. So, uh, what percentage of Americans believe that the Apollo moon landings in 1969 were fake? Oh, I'm going to be really disappointed in this number. I don't know. Um, well, obviously you don't. I wouldn't have 
pick the question if I thought you knew it. <laughs> 35%, please say I'm high. 0.27. You are very high. Okay. I was really, really worried that, like, well, I guess with all the flat earth stuff taken off, I was really worried that, like, a legitimate portion of the population thought no, they were faked. like, okay. very few. But it's it's with anything. Oh, my, it's, my faith in humanity is sort of restored. It's with anything, though. I mean, the people that are vocal about it are the nutty ones, normally. I mean... That's you know, true. Everyone who's like, yep, okay, we went to the moon, they're not starting a web page with the hamster dance music on it that, you know... <laughs> You got that have one. You, have you seen the video of uh, Buzz Aldrin like socking that dude? No. Yes. I'll have to look that up after we get done here. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Okay. Um, Bournemouth College, which I don't know where that is, of technology claimed the record for cramming the most students into a 1952 Volkswagen Beetle. How many people did they fit in the Beetle? 17. 103. What? I don't know if like they put them on top and they counted them as no. in. Okay. I don't, I'm not, I don't like know. Like if they have a finger in, they're in? Cause... No, like they, well, from what I saw, they had to not be on the ground. Like they couldn't be. So this is on, not in. Well, or in and on. I don't know. Okay. Because there ain't no way. Uh, no, to actually fit inside the vehicle and like close the doors. can't fit four people in one. <laughs> not comfortably. <laughs> no, uh, it wasn't, they couldn't be external of the vehicle. Ah, okay. So, I, maybe I should have clarified that a little bit better. But. Okay, because, yeah, they're, <laughs> I thought you meant, like, the phone booth stunt, like, where they cram people and in the phone And then have booth. to close the door, yeah. yeah. No, no, okay. not that. Okay. How high in feet is the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Wow. That seems like something I would know. And I was trying to give you some that I, you know. I've, like I said, I have, I have weird knowledge and weird gaps. Um, I don't know if I had to ballpark it. It's probably not really super tall 120 foot 183.27 feet 183 feet. on what side because it's that's it's vertical linear running oh, okay. how tall it was originally <laughs> supposed to be <laughs> okay which pair of what brand of boots were made from originally made from tires the first pair was originally made of tires this brand that was a horribly red question really um wouldn't be Red Wings. Those are way too expensive. I I really don't know. I don't Doc Martens. Guess. Really? You're made of tires. They, they, I mean, they kind of have that look about them to this day. But and they still weigh about as much as a Volkswagen. Yes, they do. I never would have guessed that. Yeah. Doc Martens. Yep. Huh. In which Asian mountain range is the Yeti said to live? Um, mountain range? I thought the Yeti was from Nepal. I thought, I don't know. Which one's Everest in? <laughs> I don't that know. one, no. Um, I, I don't know, honestly. Himalayas. The Himalayas. Yeah. I would have thought you would have guessed Nepal. that Nepal. Yeah. There you go. I was trying to remember where the Yeti was supposed to be from. Yeah. Well, so, okay. And I got this one for all of our Texas listeners because we seem to have a fair amount of them. In Texas, it is legal to put graffiti on your neighbor's what? Wife. Cow. Which could be the same. But... <laughs> <laughs> But my wife just yelled Chad Allen from the other room, which is my middle name. So that tells you I have been yelled at. All right. We need you to post pictures of your graffitied cows. Or wife. Or wife. Or both. On uh, YouTube, where you can find us. Uh, just look for Eminent Waste of Time or Eminent Performance. Either one will get you to us. Yep. Uh, we can also be found on Instagram at Eminent Racing. Facebook, same thing, slash Eminent Racing. Or on the web at EminentPerformance.com. Want to throw out a huge thank you once again to Watch Communications for hosting the podcast and the website. Also want to thank TGM Offroad, UTV-Doors.com, and Colby Valve Stems. We are way over, but you guys seem to enjoy it and don't like, I don't think we've had any stopwatch people, you know, like, you get an hour and I'm turning it off. Yep, not yet anyway. Not yet. But if you exist, that's the kind of feedback we want. If it's too long, if it's too short, just let us know. Please, seriously, make a 2018 resolution to give us feedback about the podcast, what you think, what you want to see this year, and how you want this thing to develop. Um, we're just going to keep cranking them out in the meantime, and if our listenership goes back down to zero, 
We're going to keep going anyway. We're going to keep going anyways. Oh, that's the one thing I did want to bring up. We talked, we guessed we would crest seven gigs of traffic in December. Yes. We did. We basically ended up right at seven and a half. Yep. So thank you for that growth. Uh, we're, it means people are listening and we're excited about that. So we're going to keep cranking these out. We'll be back next week with another one. This one should be published this Friday and uh, we're going to keep on that schedule unless somebody tells us otherwise or the FCC or other government entity shuts us down. Yeah. But until then, thanks for riding along with us. Thanks guys. 